This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now I am so excited for today's guest because we've been trying to make this happen for over a month now and it's finally going to happen. I will be talking to Gary K. Wolf, the man who created Roger Rabbit. Yes, he wrote that book in 1981, Who Censored Roger Rabbit, which led to the Disney film Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. A timeless, timeless classic. A movie that Disney got right so good back in the 80s. And uh, he has a new book out called uh, Jessica Rabbit Exerius. And... uh, it's funny. I I was was uh, I was reading up on his earlier books. It seems like he was going in a science in a science fiction direction in the earlier books with a little bit of counterculture. And I'm going to um, find out about that today as well. And uh, Gary's a great guy, and it's going to be a great conversation. Uh, it's February eighth. This could have been Lana Turner's birthday if she were alive, and she knew my great aunt and. Things did not turn out well for their rela- their relationship because they were friends for a long time. And then once fame happened, they stopped being friends. But nevertheless, happy birthday, Lana Turner. So yeah, here is my interview with Gary K. Wolf. Please! Hey, how you doing? It's Gary. Hey, Gary. Welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? I'm fine, thank you very much. This is uh, such a great honor. Uh, thank you for taking the time today. Oh, it's, it's my great pleasure. I, you know, at this point in my career, I'm just happy that anybody remembers who I am. <laughs> awesome. So, going back in time, I was reading that uh, you spent your childhood reading comic books and science fiction stories uh, because you were an only child. Uh, did, did you begin writing and drawing cartoons at that early age? Well, um, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you how I kind of got started. Okay. Um, and uh, it all started in the maybe second grade. Mm-hmm. Um, my second grade teacher gave the class uh, a picture to take home in color, and the whole object of this exercise was to stay inside the lines. Mm-hmm. That's all. So all you had to do was stay inside the lines. So I took that picture home. And I started coloring it, and nobody was better at staying inside the lines than I was, so uh, this was going to be a pretty easy assignment for me. I took a look at that picture, which was um, a, kind of a typical farm scene. And, I, you know, I, I grew up in a farm town in Oval, Illinois, so I, mm-hmm. a typical farm scene. There was a, there was a, a barn and a, and a farmhouse and a, you know, fence and a meadow and, and there was one cow out in the middle of the out in the middle of the meadow. So I, you know, I colored the grass green, the, the barn red, and the mm-hmm. farmhouse yellow, which was the color farmhouses were around Earlville. Colored the uh, the fence brown, and you know I'm looking at that cow all by itself out there in the middle of the field. Mm-hmm. And my my mom had always told me that when people were alone, that they got sad and they got lonely, they got blue. Yeah. I'm thinking, well, you know, it works for people work for cows so I colored that cow blue and I you know handed the picture in the next day and day after that the teacher handed them all back except for mine and she said Gary says come up here in the front of the room and I went up and she said now face the class and I thought oh geez I, you know I'm getting special treatment because I stayed inside the lines better than everybody and she held that picture up over my head mm-hmm. and she said class look at this stupid stupid picture oh Everybody knows that cows are brown, cows are white, cows are black. Cows are sometimes white, brown, and black, all three. He says, never, ever, ever are cows blue. They just do not exist. He says, Gary, don't you ever do anything this stupid again. She called my mother. My, my, my mother had to go to school, which was a big deal. And but the teacher told my mother, she said, I think there's something wrong with Gary. I think he might need to see a psychologist. He's he's coloring cows blue. So that night, my my mom and dad called me into the living room and sat me down. And my mom says, "Gary, says, I had to go to school today." She says, "Why did you color that cow blue?" And I I told her, "I said, Mom, I says, you know, it wasn't me. 
me. It wasn't me. It was you. You were the one who told me that people sand lonely, they get blue. I figured, well, cows sand lonely, they get blue. So I colored the cow blue. <laughs> and my mom says, well, you, you go outside and play for a while. Your dad and I have to talk about this. So I went outside. Now, you got to know that my mother and my father uh, were, were working people. I mean, my, my dad owned the pool hall in that, that small town, and my mom worked in the school cafeteria. Mm-hmm. My dad had dropped out of school in the third grade to go to work during the Depression, and my mom had dropped out of school in the eighth grade to go to work during the Depression. So these were not what you would call upscale, well-educated urban liberals. I mean, these, <laughs> these were hard-working folks, and I didn't think this story was going to have a happy ending. And so, you know, my mom called me back. She said, Gary, come back in. We, we've talked about this, and we've decided... Your dad and I have decided that the next time you want to color a cow blue, you go ahead and color a cow blue. And so <laughs> she called my she called my teacher and, and told her exactly that. And uh, you know that was the first validation that I'd ever had of my creativity. I, I mean, I still have that picture it's hanging over my desk. I'm looking at it right now. Um, so yeah, you know, like a week later, the, the same teacher gave us an assignment, and she said. Uh, I, I want you to write what you did on your summer vacation, one page of what you did on your summer vacation. And so mm-hmm. kids are, are writing about how they went to Shabna Lake and how they went to Wisconsin and how they went to Chicago to the museum. And I wrote one page about how I went out into my backyard and I used tin foil and tin cans and I built a rocket ship and went to the moon. Wow. <laughs> and she gave me back the paper the next day and said, well, that was a very interesting trip. Um, and you know, ever, ever since then, um, I've been coloring a lot of cows blue. Um, you know, from, from there, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't write fiction and I, and I, I gotta make, make one, one thing clear. I'm, I'm the writer. I'm not, the, not the illustrator. I can't draw a straight line. Right. Um, I, I, you know, other people draw for me. I tell them what this looks like in my head and. And right. the talented artists at Disney or Warner Brothers or wherever else um, make it into a reality. But I'm, I'm not an artist. Um, but I, uh, I started writing fiction years later when um, when uh, I started writing poems mm-hmm. for the uh, for the young woman who eventually became my wife. And, and uh, mm-hmm. she knew I loved science fiction. I mean, I, I read nothing but science fiction and. She said, you know, your poems are so wonderful. She said, you should try writing a science fiction story. So I, I did exactly that. I tried writing a science fiction story, and it wound up being 50 pages long, and it took me a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sent it off to a science fiction magazine. I didn't hear anything. And I figured, well, you know, that must be how it goes in this business. They probably threw it in a trash can somewhere. A year later, I get a telegram saying, we love your science fiction story, and we'd love to buy it, uh, and we'll give you $50, a dollar a page. And I thought, wow, you know, this is great, because that, that was the first validation I'd ever had, that I was an actual professional writer. So um, I used, uh, used that $50, mm-hmm. living in San Francisco at the time, I used that nice. $50 to buy myself... Uh, a writerly wardrobe, and I went to Upper Grant Street, um, and uh, I bought myself uh, a black turtleneck. Uh, I bought myself a, um, a, a jacket, uh, you know, a, a sport coat with leather sleeves on it, and to wear over my turtleneck. And I bought myself a pair of uh, leather pants, custom-made <laughs> leather pants, which. You know, every writer in the world was probably wearing that in those days. Um, and I, it's, I'm happy to say I can still fit into them. Um, <laughs> the only problem was this was this was the 70s and uh, bell bottoms were the thing. So my my custom made leather pants have got like 80 inch bell bottoms, and uh, uh, I look like something out of a uh, an ABBA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> video, whatever. But I, you know, I wrote a ton of short stories. Uh, wrote a wrote a whole bunch of uh, science fiction novels. Um, uh, the Resurrectionist. Um, 
Killer Bowl, uh, a generation removed, three science fiction novels, mm-hmm. and I, I always wanted to push the envelope. I always wanted to do something that had never been done before. And so for my fourth novel, um, I, when I wrote Killer Bowl, my mm-hmm. first science fiction novel, my, my agent sent it to Doubleday, and Doubleday came back and said, yeah, we love this guy. Uh, here's a here's a four-novel contract, you know, mm-hmm. four novels, and he can write whatever he wants, and we'll, we'll publish him. Just tell him to write them and send them to us, and we'll publish them. So I did the three novels, and, and I was working on the fourth novel of my four-novel contract, and I, 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 you know, I really wanted to do something totally unique, and I wanted to incorporate um, the things that I had loved when I was a kid, and yeah. I still love them, and, and that was um, comic books. Um, you know, my mom, again, um, told me, she said, you know, if you want to get out of this town, if you want to if you want to go do something else and, and, and not wind up running your father's pool hall, the, the thing that you can do to make that happen is to read. So uh, it's just read, 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 and that will get you out of this town. But she didn't put any restriction on what I could read. So I, mm-hmm. what I read? Well, I read comic books. You know, I read Batman, Superman, uh, Wonder Woman, uh, Uncle Scrooge, Donald Duck, you know, whatever I get my hands on. And um, the, the, my dad... My dad, who was not a big reader, um, he read what in those days they called true crime magazines. And those, these were uh, these were magazines that uh, featured articles about <laughs> true crime, and <laughs> had a, a photographer. Uh, they, it was basically the, the, the most famous one of these is a guy named Ouija. And uh, if you ever saw Tom Hanks' movie Road to Perdition. Uh, Jude Law played a photographer based on this Ouija guy, and he would go to crime scenes, uh, murders, mm-hmm. like, and would photograph the crime scene, and sometimes move the bodies around to make them more photogenic. Then he would sell those pictures to these true crime magazines, mm-hmm. and you know, so my dad read, um, and of course they're around the house, and so I read them too. And you know, once again, my mom didn't say, "Hey, don't read those; they'll rot your brain." Uh, so, so luckily I graduated from horrific, uh, illustrated articles about true murders to, uh, better crime writers, and, uh, um, Dashiell Hammett, uh, um, you know, the, the, that kind of thing. And I started reading noir, mm-hmm. uh, mysteries. So I wanted to do something that would combine my love of noir crime fiction and mysteries and my little comic books uh you know and not easily done <laughs> yeah you know, you know i'm trying to think how can i combine these two and uh one day i was i was watching saturday morning cartoons um you know for research i told my wife this is <laughs> research uh and I, I i didn't like the cartoons because i had grown up on the cartoons of the 40s and the 50s um, and uh, these were pretty simplistic and I didn't think very well done but I was fascinated by the uh, by the commercials mm-hmm. they saw I saw cartoon characters like the Trix Rabbit Captain Crunch Snap, Snap Crackle and Pop um, Tony the Tiger and they're talking to, to real kids, and nobody seems to think that's odd. And I said, you know, what a great idea that would be for a novel. Mm-hmm. What would you do if you had a world where cartoon characters are real? What kind of a world would that be? So uh, that was my premise. Um, I, uh, I started writing the novel. I started researching first. I researched cartoon characters, uh, uh comic book characters, uh, newspaper, comic strip characters, to see what they did that would be really interesting and unusual uh, in a human world. And, uh, you know, I, I started my story. Uh, I came up with Roger Rabbit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I wanted to do a rabbit um, because I wanted him to be, and this was way before I ever formed a relationship with Disney. I wanted him to be a, a Disney-like rabbit. Yeah. And, um, you know,
know, Warner Brothers had bugs, and uh, Disney did not really have a, a rabbit star, so I made him like mm-hmm. a, a Disney-like rabbit, uh, gave him a, you know, a, a humanoid, uh, drop-dead gorgeous wife, Jessica, uh, you know, paired him up with baby Herman, and then uh, brought in my hard-boiled detective, Eddie Valiant, I named a... Uh, I named my detective after my father, Eddie, uh, give him an homage. And uh, uh, it took me a year to research and a year to write, so it took me two years. And wow. of course, yeah, this was this was the fourth novel in my um, in my four novel contract. So my agent sent it into uh, Double Day. And uh, you know, in all my career, I've, I've written a ton of short stories and. At mm-hmm. that point, three novels. I never had a reject. I mean, nobody ever gave me a reject. Uh, so he sent Roger Rabbit to Doubleday, and they rejected it. Uh, <laughs> the first reject I ever had, Roger Rabbit. Uh, so I called my, my editor. I said, Sharon, hey, why did you reject this? I said, this is, this is the best thing I've ever read. And she says, oh, I agree. She says, it's funny. It's, it's, it's so unusual. Uh, and she said, that's why, because I, I, it's not like anything you've ever written. It's not like anything anybody's ever written. So I had to send it to the marketing department. And they were the ones who rejected it. And so I called the head of the marketing department. And I said, hey, Chuck, you know, why don't you reject my book? And he said, oh, he said, we, we all loved it. We thought it was hilarious, you know, so well done, mm-hmm. pretty creative. But there's no category for it on the bookstore shelves. It's, it's not an adult book. It's not really a fantasy. Uh, it's not really a mystery. It's not really straight fiction. There's no category for it. We can't sell this book. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I said, well, look, you know, what would you do if somebody sent you today, if somebody sent you Alice in Wonderland or The Wizard of Oz or Gulliver's Travels? What would you do with those? And he thought for a moment, he says, well, I couldn't sell those either. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> I went back to my agent. I said, look, you know, Bill, I said, if if I can't sell this book, I don't want to be a writer anymore because this is what I want to write. He said, oh, don't worry, we'll, 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 we'll find a home for it. So he started sending it out to other publishers, uh, sometimes multiple editors of the same publisher, and it kept getting rejected, uh, always for the same reason. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can't sell this book. There's no category for it. We all well, think it's hilarious. Uh, occasionally, I would get, oh, nobody wants to read a book about a talking rabbit. Occasionally, I would get that. And sometimes, oh, nobody's going to understand it. But um, the, the rejects just piled up. And, and I used to, in those days, you got them by mail. Mm-hmm. They came by mail. You see, as a letter. There was no email in those days. And my wife used to call me going out to the, mailbox every day, the daily disappointments, because I'd go out and come back with, you know, 10 rejects, um, which I also still have. I, I've kept all of those. Uh, so finally, uh, you know, 110 rejects, this book accumulated 110 wow. times as it was rejected. On the 111th submission, it went to St. Martin's Press. Mm-hmm. A, a young editor at St. Martin's named Rebecca Martin, mm-hmm. um, no relation to the St. Martin, just a coincidence. But uh, she was a, a hot editor for them and had just edited a major bestseller. So the president of the company gave her a vanity project. He said, look, he said, you can you can publish any book you want. Mm-hmm. You know, the next time you get a book that you really love, you can publish it. And just at that time, Roger Rabbit came across her desk. So she read it and she loved it. And so she went to the president of the company and said, here's the book I want to publish. Mm-hmm. So he said, okay. He said, um, well, I'll take it home tonight. I'll read it. I'll get back to you in the morning. So he took it home, read it that night, came back the next day, called her in the office and said, Rebecca, he said, I told you you could publish any book you wanted, but you can't publish this because I can't sell it. <laughs> and mm-hmm. Rebecca stepped up to the plate and said, look, you said what you said. Either you publish the book or I quit. And so he published the book, and um, albeit in very, very small quantities. I think there are, he published it in less than, less than 500 copies, which is, I mean, it's really nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, looking back on it, 
it, it, people always ask me, would you do anything differently if you had a time machine? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think if I had a time machine, I would go back in time and I would buy up all 500 of those books because <laughs> they came out at a price of $2.98. And now if you can find one on eBay, they're well north of $400. So yeah. I, would have, I would have bought all 500 and, you know, put them in a, put them in a barn somewhere and, and uh, you know, I'd be right around the limousine today. But anyway, um, so when, they, they agreed to publish it. And um, I sold it in 1980, but it didn't come out until 1981 because it took mm-hmm. long. Did, uh, did the book get a good reception? Well, I'll, 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 yeah, it, it was it was very well reviewed. Mm-hmm. Um I've, I've got, uh, if you if you buy a copy of it today, I've, I've got it, it's been reprinted. If you buy a copy of it today, you'll see um, there, are, there are tons and tons and tons of, of reviews for it. And uh, none of them say, I can't understand it. <laughs> and in <laughs> fact, I've gotten all kinds of comments, you know, criticisms about the book, mostly about Eddie's drinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, but never have I gotten anybody who says, oh, I can't understand this. Or this is a book about a talking rabbit. This is weird. Right. Well, you know, it came out in. Uh, it was going to come out in 1981. I've written in 1980, so there was a year mm-hmm. when between the time it I wrote and the time it came out. And in that year, um, I got a phone call at home, and uh, you know, I answer the phone. The guy on the other end of the phone says, "Is this Gary K. Wolf?" And I said, "Yes, it is." He says, "This is Roy Disney with the Walt Disney Company." I said, yeah, right. <laughs> Give me a break. Who is this really? Who's putting me on? I thought it was one of my friends putting me on. You know, Roy Disney calling me at home. I said, no way. I said, no, mm-hmm. no, no, really. It's Roy Disney. He says, I just read your book, and I'm wondering if you'd be interested in having Disney make it into a movie. And I said, yeah, right. The book hasn't come out yet. How'd you get a hold of my book? Well, it turns out that somebody is St. Martin's, and I never, I never found out who I... I tried desperately to find out who did this, but I mm-hmm. never found out. I wanted to kiss her or him full on the lips, but somebody at St. Martin's Press sent a copy of the manuscript to the Walt Disney Company and said, mm-hmm. hey, we're going to publish this book, and we think it would be perfect for the Walt Disney Company. And they read it, and it went up the, up the line, and it got to Roy Disney eventually, and they all thought, yeah, it would be perfect for the... Uh, for the Walt Disney Company. So um, he said, you know, would you be interested in letting us make a movie of this? Well, Mm -hmm. uh, if you read the book, the book is a little different from the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, Same characters, much different story, because the movie is a movie. And, you know, you go into the theater, you sit down, and the the movie starts, and you really don't have to use your imagination. I mean, you you see what there is, and it, it... it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. With a book, you have to use your imagination, and so I wrote the book to be the best possible book I know how to write. So there are a lot of things in the book that w- would not translate to the movies. Like in the book, the characters are uh, not characters in cartoons; they're characters in comic books and newspaper strips. So they talk in word balloons. So instead of talking to a tune. Uh, you kind of read him because he puts up a word balloon and then you read his word balloon and if he turns around, his word balloon turns around. So you, you have to either learn to read backwards or, you know, turn around with him. And if somebody gets shot with a tuned gun, uh, it produces a bang balloon and, uh, you know, that bang balloon gets kind of brittle and falls on the ground and you can pick it up and then you can compare it with bang balloons from other guns until you find the bang balloon that matches and then mm-hmm. you've got the got the right gun, uh, when somebody plays the piano, the notes stream off into the air and, and people will collect those streams of notes and cut them into 8 by 10 sheets and that's where sheet music comes from. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the book that relates to cartoons and, and I mean, to uh, uh, tunes uh, from newspapers and, and comic books that just wouldn't work in a movie. Uh, yeah. You know, so... I really didn't think this was a filmable book. I didn't think you could ever make a movie of this book. Um, but Disney said they would give me more money than everything I ever made put together. And 
and I said, well, yeah, sure, welcome to try. So uh, they started working on it in mid-1980, and, um, you know, for a while they kind of proved me right. They they really couldn't make it into a movie. They, mm-hmm. uh, they, they And a lot of it was because they did not have the technology. The mm-hmm. technology that, that existed in, in, at that time uh, did not allow them to realistically uh, combine live action with three di- three dimensional animation they just they just didn't have the technology so uh they tried and tried and it just didn't look right and it was horrible and so finally ray disney came to me and he said hey you know we're not having much luck with this 3d animation uh, with this animation live action thing uh what would you say if we uh if we did it with costume characters like they have at disneyland mm-hmm. No, we'll have Roger Rabbit in a costume and Jessica in a costume. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, I'm going to get Fred McMurray <laughs> the alien. I mean, I'm going to get Haley Mills as Jessica, <laughs> uh, Dean Jones as the rabbit, and uh, Kirk Russell as, as baby, uh, baby Herman. <laughs> that would have been great, actually. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So Steve Spielberg, 
comes on board to produce Roger Rabbit. And um, to show you what a difference Steve Spielberg makes in Hollywood, yeah. um, four years earlier, uh, Roy Disney had gone to Warner Brothers. And they said, hey, we're making a live-action animated movie, and uh, we would really love to have Bugs Bunny uh, appear on screen just as a cameo and say, hey, what's up, Doc? Crunch a carrot and walk off. Right. What do you think? And Warner Brothers looked at Roy Disney and said, get lost. Get lost. There's no way (laughs) Bugs Bunny is ever going to appear in a a Walt Disney picture. This is never going to happen. So five years later, Steve Spielberg walks in and makes the identical request. And Warner Brothers says, of course. Yes, Bugs, absolutely. He says, what about Porky Pig? Don't you want him too? And how about the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote? And what about Yosemite Sam? You know, take them all. Take them all. Um, that's the difference Steve Spielberg makes. The the only mm-hmm. requirement they put on him, yeah. uh, Bugs Bunny, being a superstar, had a contract. And his contract specified that he had to be in every scene with Mickey Mouse. You could not have Mickey Mouse in a scene without bugs. And they had to have the exact same number of words of dialogue. So if you go back tonight and watch the movie, uh, Mm -hmm. time it and count the words, and you will see that they are always on screen together. Right. And they have the exact same number of words of dialogue. So, um, you know, Steve Spielberg uh, came on board, and his first first hire was Bob Zemeckis. Yeah. Bob Z had read the book when it first came out, as had Steve Spielberg. Mm-hmm. And they both read the book when it first came out and both thought it would be a great movie. And Disney had offered Bob Z uh, the directing job. And uh, Bob Z thought, eh, Disney doesn't have the clout to do this. And um, so he went off and directed some little known movies like Back to the Future and, you know, Forrest Gump. But once Steve Spielberg got involved, uh, he came back in and. I uh, said, yeah, yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll do this. Uh, so now we, we have a great director. Um, they needed an animation director. And mm-hmm. Eve wanted to bring in someone from outside the company to oversee the Disney animators. Um, we looked at a lot of people. We looked at uh, um, Chuck Jones, who did uh, all the Warner Brothers characters, who did Bugs Bunny. And everybody loved him. He was such a great guy, and, and everybody loved him. Everybody wanted him. But the feeling was that at the time, he was, I think, in his maybe late 70s. Yeah. The feeling was that they thought he was too old. And they thought that, that the workload might kill him. Yeah. And uh, this was one of the few times that I've ever seen anybody in Hollywood worry about the health of their employees. You know, usually it's a, you know... <laughs> He'll work until you drop, and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll bury you at your desk and bring in the next guy. Uh, so Chuck Jones was off the table. So uh, then they looked at Ralph Bakshi, who, who did the animated R-rated Fritz the Cat. And mm-hmm. um, uh, I often wonder what Ralph Bakshi would have done with Jessica. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, Steve said, no, not Ralph Bakshi. He thought Ralph Bakshi was too much of a goon. Yeah. So they, they, um, they finally settled on uh, Richard Williams, Dick Williams, who was an American living in London, London expat. And um, he had won a, an Academy Award for the Pink Panther and had done a, a, he was currently doing a series of uh, commercials for a, a beer company. I can't remember the name of it, but you can find them on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And it's all about a cat who wants to have a beer. And the cat tries to get the beer and fails and falls to his death. And But he's got nine lives, so, you know, he comes back in his next life and tries to get a beer. And he uh, can't get the beer and falls to and dies again. And uh, If you watch those, you'll mm-hmm. find that, uh, that uh, a lot of the gag bits in those commercials are gag bits that, uh, Dick later recycled and used in Roger Rabbit. Mm. Uh, but Dick was the perfect guy for this. He uh, he sat down with me, and together we visualized uh, 
my characters. And, and you know, I'm a writer. I'm not a, I'm not an artist. I've never drawn them. I, I never, never even thought about drawing them. And so he visualized first Roger and drew a couple of iterations of Roger. Uh, he said that uh, in, in the book, Roger was a gray rabbit. Um, he said he thought that Roger would look better animated as a white rabbit because he would pop more off the screen. Yeah. Um, I, you know, that was an artistic choice. You know, fine with me. Uh, he added the orange top knot to Roger to give him a little bit of color. Um, and uh, uh, that was it. He, he then drew Jessica, and he based we based Jessica on a couple of things. Um, Ava Gardner, uh, the movie star who um, posed in that uh, kind of negligee on the cover of Life magazine that became one of the uh, hottest selling posters in World War II. Every GI in the world had it hanging on his yeah. the locker room. Uh, Veronica Lake with her uh, peekaboo hairdo uh, from that era. Mm -hmm. And Betty Grable, uh, Marilyn Monroe, of course. And um, uh, actually a little bit of Tinkerbell. I always saw uh, Jessica Rabbit as Tinkerbell growing up in Funky. Oh, yeah. And um, so, uh, but the, the main influence was a Tex Avery character. Tex Avery was an animator yeah. I made it for Warner Brothers back in the 50s. And uh, he had a character named Red Hot Riding Hood. Yeah, Swing Shift Cinderella. <laughs> Swing Shift Cinderella. Love know. that. And uh, also available on YouTube. You should you should check it out. The best. Uh, so uh, she is, she is like Jessica's grandmother. Uh, we, we modeled Jessica after Red Hot Riding Hood. Um, uh, he, he, Dick wanted to make Jessica anatomically uh, impossible. You know, that really narrow waist and the wide hips and, and huge bosom. Uh, and he wanted to do that because uh, he, he wanted this movie to really impress other animators. That's what he was doing with this movie. He wanted, he wanted other animators outside the Disney company to, to look at this movie and say, oh my God, how did they do that? Uh, and there's a technique in animation called rotoscopy, mm -hmm. where uh, you film real people doing something, and then you uh, animate over that. You actually draw right over that so that the, the, the animated characters look like real people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Perfectly acceptable. And they used it in Cinderella. They used it in Snow White. Uh, those were real people, and they just animated over that. But he wanted everybody to know that Jessica was a, was a unique character, completely animated. So he made her, her proportions, um, you know, impossible and, um, uh, you know, it worked. Yeah. Um, they turned out that of all the characters, Jessica was the most difficult for the animators because they had been used to animating ducks and geese and mice and, barnyard animals and now they were being asked to animate uh, not just a, a woman but kind of the essence of a woman you know the ideal woman and they just couldn't seem to get it right they just couldn't get the hang of it so uh, we were filming in London uh, in this sound stage in London um, <laughs> Steve Spielberg loves the food there you know go figure yeah. Uh, but we were filming in London, this big sound stage at uh, Hill Street Studios. And um, so Bob Z went down to the London's North End where all the strip clubs were, and he hired a stripper and <laughs> brought her back. And, and they f he filmed her coming down the runway dressed in a red dress like Jessica. And she did Jessica's song and Jessica's walk. And then he filmed her. Uh, doing the same thing, but wearing only brown panties, so that the animators get a feeling for how, you know, a woman's body moves when she walks. Mm -hmm. And then he did it again a third time with her naked. And um, for weeks after that, you, know, you could go through the animation department and you could hear the guy saying, "Geez, you know, I've been here so many hours, I forgot what a woman looks like. Let's watch the Jessica film again." <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, no, you know, we had a lead animator, we had a director, we had a producer, we needed 
somebody to star as Eddie Valiant. Uh, because it, it really, if Eddie Valiant, the detective, if, if he couldn't make the audience believe that these characters were real, the whole premise would go out the window. I mean, yeah. that's what happened with Howard the Duck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you just did not believe that those characters were real. It was a little man in a duck suit, you know? So, so they they also wanted, because this was an unproven premise, I mean, a, you know, cartoons and humans coexisting, mm-hmm. you really didn't know if this was going to be a kid's movie or an adult movie. Would people take this seriously? Would, would anybody come in the door? Would people buy tickets? So they wanted to get somebody... Um, who who was uh, a, a proven uh, box office draw, mm-hmm. uh, and so somebody with, a, with name recognition. So they, they we did a lot of auditions. We auditioned uh, actually Kurt Russell, mm-hmm. <laughs> who could have been maybe yeah. Herman too, but uh, we we auditioned him. Uh, James Woods, uh, Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford. Yes, yeah. uh, everybody wanted Harrison Ford. I, but when he saw the the timing of it, how long it was going to take, he couldn't do it. Uh, Paul Newman, we we all wanted Paul Newman, but the same thing, he just could not cut out that much time for for a single movie. So finally, uh, we found the guy that everybody thought would be the ideal Eddie Valiant, you know, mm-hmm. comic actor who had a big name and would draw people in, uh, no matter what the movie. And that, of course, was Bill Murray. Yeah. And yeah, so. Uh, you know, we're filming with Bill Murray, and, you know, not only could Bill Murray not convince an audience that those cartoon characters were real, Bill Murray didn't believe it himself. I mean, yeah. Look at, he would look at Roger Rose and say, oh my God, you're a talking rabbit. What are you doing here? It's just like, dream? And so they bought Bill Murray out of his contract, one million dollars, mm-hmm. and uh, kept looking. Uh, so... Uh, you know, finally, they found someone that would be the perfect Eddie Valiant. You know, another guy, big name, recognition, bring people in. And that, of course, was Eddie Murphy. Yeah. You know, Eddie Murphy is a black Eddie Valiant. And um, we, we suddenly found ourselves rewriting the script to make Eddie Valiant funnier than the tunes. And, of course, that wasn't working either, so... Uh, Eddie Murphy got bought, bought out of his contract. He got a million dollars and a and a new Ferrari. Yeah. Um, so you know, we we went back to to the looking. We're we're still looking. And I mean, I'm on the other side of Hollywood. Uh, Brian De Palma is filming The Untouchables, mm-hmm. and he really wants Bobby De Niro to be Al Capone. But Bobby De Niro is making another movie and can't do it. So. De Palma hires a little-known English actor named Bob Hoskins. Yeah. And you know, Bob Hoskins, classically trained Shakespearean actor, uh, made some great movies, The Long Good Friday and uh, Mona Lisa, you know, not, a, not a Hollywood draw, yeah. but a really, really great actor. And he was portraying Al Capone. Well, you know, a couple of weeks into the shoot, uh, Bobby De Niro calls the Palma and says, hey, I finished early. I could be Al Capone after all. So mm-hmm. they bought out Bob Hoskins. And now Bob Hoskins has a million dollars and nothing to do, right? Mm-hmm. So um, he comes in and he auditions. And I, I, I told the guy, I said, Jesus, you know, it, this isn't going to work. The guy is not just, he's not just British. He's Cockney British. You know, he, he's... How is he going to convince anybody that he's a prototypical American private eye? So he got up on stage and started doing a reading, mm-hmm. and uh, it was it was magical. He he was on a, a bare stage, nobody around him, mm-hmm. and and uh, he was talking to well, we brought in Charlie Fleischer, who we uh, we had hired to do the voice. He was talking to Charlie Fleischer. And if you squinted your eyes, you could see the rabbit. He made you believe that that rabbit was there, and that rabbit was real. And um, so, you know, we hired him, and um, best thing we ever did. He, the guy was phenomenal. My, you know, they always people always ask me, well, is there anything about the movie that you didn't like or that you would change? 
uh, or, or that you're disappointed with. And I, I have one major disappointment. My one major disappointment is that Bob Hoskins, who did what I thought was the greatest job of acting that I have ever seen mm -hmm. human being do, wasn't even nominated for an Academy Award. I know. And he should have won that Academy Award hands down. I mean, there were times... And Christopher Lloyd, he was brilliant as Judge Doom. Absolutely. He should have won a, a Best Supporting Actor. Yeah. Really. Yeah, and, and, you know, there, I mean, there were times when Bob Hoskins was standing on an empty soundstage with a green screen behind him, making everything up in his head. And he told me that toward the end of the movie, toward the end of the filming, he could see the rabbit. Mm -hmm. I uh, hung out with him a couple of years later when he was in Boston filming um, Mermaids. Oh, yeah. Uh, he told me that uh, it took about seven months before the rabbit finally went away, that he couldn't see the rabbit anymore. And it, his son was getting jealous because Bob Hoskins was spending more time playing with the rabbit than he was playing with his son. So, uh, you know, now we, we had all the pieces put together. Um, oh, we, we had to get... Uh, we had to get the voice of Jessica too. That was that was very important. Yeah. The voice of Roger. We we got Roger. Um, we went to a comedy club to see to see Charlie Fleischer perform because we'd heard he was a pretty good voice actor. And Charlie did uh, a bit of uh, Donald Duck having an orgasm. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, that's hilarious. So we hired Charlie to do the voice of Roger Rabbit, and he worked with me and with Dick Williams to come up with the voice because I you know not only had I never seen Roger in the book he didn't speak um, so um, uh, they worked on it worked on it and, and Dick Williams felt that every successful cartoon character had a speech impediment yeah um, you know Porky Pig with his stutter and Daffy Duck with his lisp and uh, so Charlie worked a lot of stuff and finally Charlie came up with the stutter on P which was you know brilliant worked perfectly and uh we we put together a a costume a roger rabbit costume charlie came to the set and did all of roger's lines on the set um with bob hoskins uh, and um you know but still bob hoskins the, the, even though he was talking to charlie who was in costume mm -hmm. it wasn't in the frame there was nothing in the frame and and if you look at Bob Hoskins, when he's handcuffed to Roger, those handcuffs are on a spring. So not only is Bob Hoskins controlling his arm, by the way he moves his arm, he's controlling the spring that controls Roger's arm. So he has to remember not only where his arm is, but where Roger's arm should be and mm -hmm. how he can move his arm. To, to and It just goes on and on. Um, when he lifts Roger by the ears, he has to remember to lift Roger with his fingers closed, not open, because if he opens his fingers, you have to animate between them, and it adds a hundred thousand dollars a minute to the cost of the production. So, uh, you know, just phenomenal. So we had we had I, Roger's voice. I met Charlie Fleischer five years ago at a comic con, and um, <laughs> you know, he's not the the friendliest guy in the world. But I also met uh, Joanna Cassidy at that same con, and she is a total delight and sweetheart. Absolutely. I uh, I kissed her hand, and then she looked at my mom and said, "You raised him right." <laughs> <laughs> well, you should have tried kissing Charlie's hand. That might have got you somewhere. I don't know. Oh no, he would have punched me. <laughs> <laughs> well. So, you know, we yeah. still needed Jessica's voice. And uh, yeah. Bob C. had worked with uh, Kathleen Turner on Romancing the Stone. and uh, You know, she just had the perfect voice, just absolutely perfect voice. And so uh, she agreed to do it, but um, she, she, like everybody else who was involved in this movie, nobody really knew whether this movie was going to be a huge success or, or a total flop. So she agreed to do it without screen credit. Mm -hmm. uh, which is what James Earl Jones did with Star Wars. Uh, with Star Wars, yeah, you know, he took Darth Vader and, and did it without screen credit. That way, if it was a success, he could say, "Oh, I was Darth Vader," and if it was a flop, he, you know, nobody would know. So she did it without credit, and she she did the voice, um, and uh, it was it was fine. I mean, she did did a great voice, but when it came time to sing the song. She couldn't sing the song. And, you know, she was pregnant at the time, like really pregnant. 
And whether she didn't have breath control or whether she just can't sing, I don't know. But Steve Spielberg was in the studio at the time uh, with Amy Irving, who was his wife at the time. And he said, oh, Amy, he said, uh, you sang it, Yenthal, why don't you give it a whack? Yeah. I said, Steve, I said, There's, nobody's going to believe that Jessica has one voice when she sings and another voice when she talks. He says, ah, nobody will know the difference. You know, they, she sings first and then she doesn't talk for a long time. Nobody's going to notice. And nobody ever did. <laughs> but if you stick around for the credits... Mm -hmm. which are as long as uh, some early movies, uh, you will see that even though Kathleen Turner doesn't get credit, uh, Amy Irving is credited. She's right. as the singing voice of Jessica Rabbit. So, uh, you know, basically all the pieces are in place. We made the movie. Um, I talked to uh, David Lander before he passed. He, he told me... Off record, I wish he had told me this on record, but off record he said out of all the movies he did, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was the one that he was the most proud of, and he hated most of the movies he was in. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 you get that over and over, and yeah. uh, it, there was a there was a, a family atmosphere about it. Um, a lot of people on that on that project played harmonica. Charlie is a harmonica virtuoso. I started taking harmonica, a whole bunch of people played harmonica. We used to go down to the hotel lobby every night and play the harmonica. It was like a old West cattle drive or something. So, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of comes across in the movie, uh, you know. So anyway, the, the movie's done, and uh, they're going to premiere it. They're going to premiere it at uh, Radio City Music Hall in New York City so that I don't have to come west. And uh, so I, I go from Boston down to New York City, and... Uh, I am, uh, I am I'm in Radio City Music Hall, and I, I'm going to see my movie start to finish for the first time, which I had never seen because they were still working on it up to like two weeks before it was released. And I, I think that if they had their their brothers, I think they'd still be working on it today. They, everybody just wanted it to be perfect. Um, but it, I had never seen it all the way through. I was going to see my credit mm -hmm. on screen for the first time. And, uh, yeah, what was your feeling when you saw the movie on the screen the first time? Uh, I, 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 was, I was overwhelmed. I mean, I could not believe that they had taken my book and it had turned it into something like that. I mean, it was just amazing. But I, when I saw the premiere, when I was at the premiere, mm -hmm. I had uh, Kathleen Turner sitting on my left. Yeah. I had Amy Irving sitting on my right. And I was going to see my movie for the first time. I was going to see my credit on screen for the first time, and I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, life just doesn't get any better than this. And, and, and then life got better, because Kathleen leaned over and put her hand on my leg and whispered in my ear, Kerry, are you excited? And I said, <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> so, uh, you know, basically, the uh, movie premiered, um, wound up uh, wound up being the top grossing movie of the year. Yeah. $780 million. Uh, won four Academy Awards. I got to go to the Academy Awards show, got to go up on stage. Uh, I sat close enough to share the smell of perfume. <laughs> and um, as a result of that, I uh, I got uh, uh, I got a four-picture deal with Disney. They told me they wanted me to write four more movies for them. And, um, the, you know, just one final note on, on the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, when... When Eddie Valiant, uh, well, well, Steve Spielberg went out and got the Warner Brothers characters, but he wanted to make sure that everybody who was involved in the movie in a major way had his or her own character, mm -hmm. her favorite character in the movie. So Bob, Bob Z's favorite character was Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. Uh, Bob Hoskins was Heckle and Jekyll. Um, uh, Dick Williams was Droopy. So Steve came to me and said, Gary, you know, what, what character do you want mm -hmm. in the movie? And I said, ah, Steve, I think I'm covered. I mean, I got Roger, I got Jessica, I got baby Herman. I, I think I'm covered. You, you know, you don't need to worry about me. He said, ah, well, I want to do something for you. So I'll, yeah, I'll do something for you. So uh, if you if you watch the movie, and, and you got to be quick because it, it's only there for a split second, when any alien goes into Toontown for the first time, and goes through the tunnel, and you know he's in the tunnel, and all of a sudden, curtains rise, and there's birds and sunlight and singing and singing flowers. And if you look over on the left, 
you're going to see a red barn, a yellow farmhouse, and a blue cow sitting all by itself out in the middle of a field. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Disneyland in the early 1990 when I was six, and we went to a parade on Main Street, and there was a giant replica of Roger announcing the parade to the crowd, and the crowd went gaga as if as, as if Roger had been around since Disney's conception. I mean, he became a huge phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was there was talk at one time about uh, uh, not canning Mickey Mouse, but Making Roger Rabbit um, the, the spokes character, right. Disney Company, because he was so popular. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. So, so real quick, tell me about um, Jessica Rabbit, Exerius Business. Like, what was the origins of the story? Oh, uh, my pandemic book. Yeah. So, um, I I wanted to. I, I thought Jessica deserved her own novel because uh, she just deserves her own novel. So uh, I decided to do an origin story um, about how a, a plain, simple, uh, not terribly attractive shop girl named um, uh, uh, Jessica Krumsky mm. can uh, metamorphose into Jessica Rabbit. And so it's, a, it's an origin story that shows how Jessica became Jessica, uh, how she met Roger, where tunes come from, and how Toontown came to be. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, no spoiler here, because you'll, you'll find that out when you read the book, mm -hmm. but Jessica's human. Yeah. Everybody is human in the book. Uh, tunes do not exist. So, in the course of the story, somehow, uh, I, I I don't want to tell you because uh, that's one of the uh, that's one of the secret moments. Uh, but somehow tunes come to be, and somehow Roger comes to be. Um, my my editor, when he read it, uh, said that it had what he called uh, oh, I I can't. It's a profanity, so I won't yeah. tell you. But <laughs> he said, oh, ah, moments in it when all of a sudden you realize what's really going on here. And um, that happens over and over again. I also wanted this book to be a book that would appeal to women. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Jessica's story, and I felt that uh, I wanted to tell Jessica's story without sexualizing her, um, without trivializing uh, her intellect. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I wrote it as a woman's book. And... Uh, I mean, you know, old guy writing a book about a woman, yeah. not easily done. So, you know, I wrote the book and it went through a couple of drafts. And uh, I have beta readers, people who read my stuff before it's printed. And um, all my beta readers this time were women. So I, uh, I, I let only women read this book because I wanted to make sure that I was not going to do anything that was going to be offensive to women or uh, that was going to trivialize Jessica. Mm -hmm. And 100% these women were, were overwhelmed by this book. Uh, the, most, the most typical comment I got was some, something on the order of, Jessica Rabbit is exactly the kind of woman I've always wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as the story is, uh, is more a secret agent than a noir mystery. But you know, Toontown, uh, the rainbow, the rainbow tent of Toontown accepts all genres, so uh, it, it fits well. Um, it's been really well reviewed. Um, I've, I've sold a ton of copies, and um, I'll, t I'll give, tell you one other interesting story: the cover, uh, because Jessica in this book is human. I did not want to use the image of Jessica on the cover mm -hmm. is, um, you know, she, she's not that, she's a human. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I was working with an artist who does my, my book covers and he, you know, I'd send him some, some pictures of real live women and he was trying to wheel on those and uh, just could never get it right. Um, and, uh, then one day over the transom, I get this, this piece of artwork from a guy named Andy Prisney, uh, who lives in Italy, 
and Andy sent me this this artwork uh, of Jessica Rabbit, and it's line artwork, um, and it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And he sent it to me and said, hey, would you post this on your Facebook page? And I, I wrote him back. I said, Andy, I said, this is, I'll do more than that. I'm going to put this on the cover of my Jessica Rabbit novel. And he was over the moon, and I said, well, uh, how much do you want for it? He said, oh, no, no, you can have it free. I said, no, that's not, that's not the way <laughs> things work. So, you know, I paid him and uh, put it on the cover of my Jessica Rabbit novel. Uh, and it's perfect. You know, it's yeah. just perfect. Plus, it's, it's the kind of serendipity that exists in Toontown. You know, where mm -hmm. if you just wait long enough, good things happen. And uh, they come to you at the right time when they're supposed to happen. Yeah, would you turn this into a movie or a series? Yes, live action movie. Live action movie, yeah. Nice. Um, but uh, timing, who knows? I mean, you know, we're still waiting for a uh, second, uh, second Roger Rabbit movie. Um, you know, and people keep asking me, is, is there ever going to be one? And all I can do is say, stay tuned. Um, <laughs> yeah, it seems like uh, you've had uh, a much better experience with uh, Disney and making this movie than, say, like, you know, P.L. Travers with Mary Poppins. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I've talked to a lot of writers who have had their books made into movies, and uh, almost almost to a person, they're unhappy. Um, yeah. I, I talked to a writer who, a very fine science fiction writer, had his book made into a science fiction movie. And he wanted to be on set. He just wanted to come visit the set. And they were filming in London, where a, a lot of the science fiction movies film. And they said, "Sure, you can. You can come on set. Um, pay your own way. You know, pay for airfare and a hotel. And when you get here, you can come on set." Mm -hmm. so he did this, and he got to London. And they said, "Oh, geez, we wrapped here last week. Now we're filming in Minneapolis." So <laughs> he couldn't afford to fly to Minneapolis, so he never did get on set. <laughs> um, he, he had to pay to go to his own to go to the premiere of his own movie. Oh, that's not right. I had a ticket. <laughs> and going, yeah, and when I look at, at what Disney did for me, I mean, Disney flew me to London, put me up at the Savoy, gave me a car and a driver, and you know, I, and he said, well, you know what? What do you do for me? And he said, Well, I drive you around. So I I'll run errands for you if you want. I says, you mean if I want a pizza? He says, yeah. I says, if I want a pizza at 2 o'clock? He says, sure, no problem. <laughs> I told my wife, you know, I said, the, 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 my biggest disappointment here is that when I pull up at the carriage entrance of Herod's department store in my limo with my driver and I get out, nobody from Earlville can be there to see me doing this, you know? That, mm -hmm. that would be just perfect. So yeah, I'm 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 happy with it. Um, happy with the happy with the way they treated me. Happy with the movie they made. What's what's your obsession with carousels, and how long have you been collecting them? Oh man, um, my my wife's father ran an amusement park in Glen Echo, Maryland, mm -hmm. and uh, we got married in 1969, and uh, so 1970, 71. Um, we decided it would be a good gay gift for him to buy him a carousel animal for a Christmas present. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we, we actually found a, a shop in Berkeley, California, the Red Book Gallery, and they restored and sold carousel animals. Well, when I saw the price of these carousel animals, this was 1971, 72, and they were going for $2,500, which was a lot of money back then. I said, this is way too good for my father-in-law, but uh, not too good for me. So uh, we found one that we really liked. We saved up for, for two years, put it kind of on a layaway, saved up for two years and got it. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of kicked <coughs> off. It was like eating salt, salted peanuts. Uh, we, we started buying others. Uh, we uh, went in with a group that bought a complete carousel that was being dismantled. Mm -hmm. We got four or five animals from that, but the 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 one the story that's that is best. Um, we found a carousel in an antique shop in Alexandria, Virginia, 
and uh, the lakes had come off, which was typical because they were put on with rabbit's hide glue, and that's water soluble. And when you put a carousel that's glued with water soluble glue next uh, out in the um, out in the midway next to the ocean, uh, the lakes are going to fall off. So uh, the lakes had fallen off, but they were still there, and they body was kind of stuffed into a trash can and the lakes were in another trash can next to it and they asked the guy how much he wanted and uh, you know uh, you, yes, I got it for 500 bucks and um, so I sent it back to uh, back to California where we were living at the time and got it to my restorer and uh, they took a look at it and they it, it looked weird it, 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 it was uh, all white um, had a kind of a goofy tail, and um, you know somebody had replaced the eyes with bicycle reflectors. And I said, "Why does it such a weird-looking horse?" And they said, "Well, it's because it's, it's not a horse; it's a zebra." Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, they, these things were made in the 1900s, and you know, the first after five years they get a paint job, and maybe they paint it as a zebra. Yeah. Maybe five <laughs> years later they still paint it as a zebra, but after 15 years. Uh, too much work, and they painted as a horse. Yeah. And um, so it turned out that this uh, that this zebra came from um, from a carousel uh, that had operated in Illinois, um, in Aurora, Illinois. And um, and I I called my mom, and I said, Mom, I said this carousel operated at Riverview Park in Aurora, Illinois. And I've got an animal from there. And she said, oh, she says, your dad and I used to used to go to that park and ride that carousel when we were courting. And I said, yeah. She says, yeah, my favorite animal was a zebra. And I said, no, ma, a zebra? She says, yeah, it had monkeys on the back. And this one had monkeys on the back. So we found in a junk shop the horse that was my mother's favorite horse from the carousel she was riding when she was courting my father. Mm-hmm. You know, at one time we had 56 of them. <laughs> we, we had to kind of downsize because yeah. uh, you know hard to cram those into uh, even a penthouse condo. But uh, you know, I give them to my fr- some to my friends and uh, put some in museums. And uh, it's a fun hobby to have. It's a, certainly an interesting hobby to have. I have to say. Um, do you have any upcoming projects or anything you'd like to plug? Um, well, I. I I do, but unfortunately I can't. Uh, I've got a major live-action animated movie that's in production, um, not Roger Rabbit, all the characters. Um, I, I am not allowed to, to announce it. The studio is uh, the one that announces it, and so I can't announce it until they do. Right. And who knows when they're going to, but... It is, it's all A-list actors, A-list director, A-list uh, screenwriters, uh, going to be sensational. And then, um, yeah, I've got a bunch of other projects that I can't talk about either. So <laughs> <laughs> you'll just have to, as we say in Hollywood, trust me, trust me on this. Okay. But, but are you at least writing a new book? I am. Uh, nice. Yeah, I'm writing uh, a couple. Uh, I'm writing one that is uh, Roger Rabbit. Mm-hmm. Roger and Eddie, and it's introducing a new category of tune, uh, which I don't want to talk about either because uh, I'm just kind of paranoid about it. And then um, I've got two others that I'm working on that uh, are not Roger Rabbit, but are kind of like fantasy uh, science fiction things. Yeah, I, I keep busy. Yeah. Nice, nice. Well, Gary, uh, thank you for finally making this happen. I, I had a good time. It took long enough. I mean, we've been working on this for a long, long time. I'm, uh, I'm happy I could do it, and I'm, uh, I'm just tickled to death. My pleasure, sir. Well, I'll keep an eye out for those new projects, and you have yourself a great day, and be safe out there. Okay, thanks. Take thank, care. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Gary K. Wolf. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy, huh? Man, he loves to talk. Great stories there, though. I loved hearing every one of them, and it was a great conversation. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. 
Later, dudes.